Hi, it's Dr. Alicia Stubble Washington, class of 88. I get to Stony Brook Medical School from the undergraduate. I went to Stony Brook undergraduate class, um, entered in 1980, finished in 84, and then went right across the road to the medical school. While in Stony Brook, I did a number of things. I started the Student National Medical Association. I was a TA for some of the first years when I was a second year. I was on the admissions committee and then finally left Stony Brook to go to Chicago. After that, I was in Chicago doing ophthalmology and somewhere halfway through at 50 below zero, I decided to go to Bermuda. <laughs> and that's where I am now. I decided to become a doctor. I thought I was gonna become a pediatrician or a dancer. My father immediately took me out of dancing school and uh, became a physician. Um, had a younger brother who had sickle cell, so that was probably one of the uh, forces that led me to healthcare and understanding that health, how important health is. Uh, as Martin Luther King says, without health, you know, there is a high rate of death. So that inequity and that um, decisions in healthcare are important. An ophthalmologist in Bermuda had gotten sick and uh, one of my father's sisters called and said, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm in Chicago. She says, well, we have no ophthalmologist, right? Um, that what you're doing there, many can do. Can you come help? So I said, okay, I thought oh, I can do it. I can, I had already at that point had 10 offices, a capitated agreement in Chicago, we had 50 employees. I had a private practice. I, you know, I can do small Bermuda and fly back and forth to Chicago. Well, we ended up practicing here. I say we, because it's a family. Um, when you make that type of decision, the family's all involved. And so here, I planted myself, became, you know, ophthalmologist on the island, which is very different than being in Chicago, you know. You are the expert. There is nobody else. There is one other ophthalmologist, and there was nobody else to ask. So the patient needs you, you need to arrive. Um, while here, I then, you know, was on the regulatory body for healthcare. I was the chairperson of that regulatory body. I was president of the active staff and represented the physicians. You know, I did um, what I came to, stand in the gap, uh, try to make the healthcare system better. And now chief of surgery and having to recall all the way back to Stony Brook, systems, care, and surgery, and filling in all the gaps that as an ophthalmologist I didn't have to do. Uh, and it's amazing that recall is well planted. <laughs> I think my class and those around me will remember Winthrop Hospital and Dr. Day because if you wanted to do surgery, you ended up there at University Hospital. And Dr. Day would take us and put us in a circle in the middle of a ward, right by the nurse's station, and then ask us one at a time a question in surgery. If you didn't answer, it was up to the next person to answer. And he didn't like you to go all the way around the circle. Virtually all of us stayed across the street in housing. So it was always just a walk across, so all of us gathering, walking towards, you know, the big lecture halls <laughs> with the carpet on <laughs> the sides. And, you know, we had a, a tape recording system because in that era, you know, no cell phones, no personal computers, it was a tape recorder. And we used to transcribe from this tape recorder. And uh, so we'd all sit in these this big lecture hall, basically, and pretty much all day, professors came in to us. Sometimes we moved around a little bit. For my class, um, we had to have a relationship with the faculty, each other, the librarians. Um, we had no internet. We had no way of really communicating outside. Um, we didn't have cell phones, so we didn't have distraction of even trying to communicate with other family members. Um, so we were with our little pods, you know, in a class of 100, that was my class, there was um, predominantly men. Um, I don't even know how many women were in the class. Um, I would say less than 20, somewhere about that amount. Um, there were five African Americans, me being one. Um, and we all had to get to know each other to some level, some people more than others as we, round, as we went out to 
um, do our clerkships, right? So we're going to Nassau County Medical Center and all of those other hospitals that had to fill in for our education. It was, it was a, it was a tour to do. It was not easy, you know, as a medical student when, you know, you had to get a car. <laughs> so we all had to buy cars. Um, we all remember when we all had, you know, different cars. We had to get new cars because our old cars <laughs> couldn't make it to all those destinations. And um, my, the interaction with professors, of course, you know, we, we held them in high esteem, you know, a little fearful of some, right? Uh, they were, they were not cuddly, but they were definitely accessible. You know, Dr. Stern, if, you know, in, in my era, if anybody doesn't know Dr. Stern, we all knew, you know, because anatomy was so critical, histology and pathology, that department was so critical to that first year. Um, Dr. Aldustus Jordan, I told you he was my mentor, an undergraduate. Um, by the time I get to medical school, he becomes um, a brother, financial advisor, <laughs> Dean, you know, someone to help you navigate the borders and understanding of where you are and what you what you will be in the future. The Renaissance School of Medicine, minority students called on the alumni, minority um, physicians to help, help mentor them, help foster their careers. And so uh, I and multiple others joined in um, uh, if I started names, I, I, I would miss out on some. Um, and we joined in to help them fill in the gaps as Dr. Jordan filled in the gaps for us. Um, fill in gaps that we didn't have once we left Stony Brook, you know, as far as having a Stony Brook alumni out there that's watching over you, that's helping you navigate the um, terrain of residency and starting your practice. We're beginning to pull in the residents. So there are Stony Brook residents who are out there who can maybe easily transfer that information to them of where they are to the medical student and also foster them to their next stage. So having that um, cadre that's beginning to fill in the alumni that we're not just medical students, we're not just residents, now we're not just senior physicians, we're actually now becoming retired physicians who are out there who now have time. So we're bridging that gap. And uh, it's exciting because Stony Brook is new, right? 50 years. Wow. When I went to Stony Brook, I had no clue how young it was. <laughs> I was just like, okay, you know, I was in the undergraduate and now I'm in the medical school. But how new, how exciting. And I think that's where you get people who are excited about that. You know, it doesn't have yet a deep tradition. We're building the tradition. There is not yet a full endowment that can just support a whole class. We are it. So I say that one amount that we can give per year that could fund one student to get through medical school is huge. And that's what I did. And I asked others to do it. That viewpoint of life is why I became distinguished and probably because I went international and I've helped Bermuda um, in its healthcare system and continue to do so. And we know the inequity. We know that without health, there is no wealth. Without wealth, there's no health. They go hand in hand. So where we can in health, that's what I'll be. That's where I'll be, you know, trying to solve those small issues, big issues in small places. But I had a full career a full career in medicine from Stony Brook. And um, it has never failed me. And I doubt it failed many of my medical school classmates. I'm eternally grateful because it implanted a sense of being, a sense of respect, respect for the patient, and respect for our colleagues. Um, I'm eternally grateful to the deans um, that incubated us, those professors that incubated us, that gave us that first jolt into medicine. Um, eternally grateful to Dr. Dustin Jordan 
um, that he mentored me through undergraduate helped me get into medical school and then knew how to step back and let me develop into who I wanted to be. And, you know, Stony Brook did its job. I hope that I've been a good person, a good physician to represent Stony Brook. <laughs>